Hello and welcome back to The Fall of the Roman Empire. It's Nick Holmes and this is episode 54 called Dinner with Attila. In the last episode, we heard how round one between Attila and the Eastern Romans in 441 had not gone at all well for the Romans. Attila and his brother Bleda had crossed the Danube and sacked the powerful fortified town of Nisus. The Eastern army was immediately recalled from Sicily, where it was preparing to attack the Vandals in North Africa. So bang went any hope of recovering Carthage. But since it took several months for the Eastern army to be shipped back, Theodosius still had to sue for peace. And the Huns humiliated the Romans. They doubled the gold tribute from £700 to 1400 But the Eastern Empire was far from finished. Theodosius and his minister Constantinus began preparing for round two. The army was strengthened by recruiting tough Isaurians from the highlands of Cilicia. A programme of extensive frontier fort building was implemented. In 443, Theodosius even felt bold enough to stop paying the annual tribute. And surprise, surprise, he got away with it, but only because Attila was too busy playing politics. In 444 or 5, he had his brother Blader murdered and emerged as the sole leader of the most powerful Hunnic confederation ever seen in the West. And now he could turn his attention again to the Romans, who'd been bad boys not paying their gold. In 447, a massive Hunnic army crossed the Danube. Our sources are light on the details of what happened in round two of Attila versus Constantinople, but it was probably the largest military engagement in Europe seen since Stilicho defeated Radagaisus's Goths in Italy 40 years before. The Huns crossed the Danube close to Nisus, which was now a blackened ruin. They took the forts along the Danube, including the most important one, Ratiaria, without too much difficulty, and then advanced east towards Constantinople. This was where the Romans were waiting for them, beside the river Eutus, just below the Danube in modern-day Bulgaria. The eastern Roman army met the Hunnic juggernaut. It was probably the largest Roman force seen in Europe for some time. And it was more Roman than either Stilicho's or Aetius's Western armies. Unlike them, it was not full of mercenary Goths, Alans and Huns. Instead, it was an army that our scant sources say was equipped with heavy Roman cavalry and horse archers. Its commander was an experienced general, Arnagisclus, who was determined to break the Huns. Battle was joined and we're told the Romans fought bravely. Arnagisclus fought to the death, having carried on fighting after his horse was killed beneath him. Casualties were said to be heavy on both sides. But the Romans couldn't hold back Attila's hordes. The pride of the Eastern army perished along the banks of the river Eutus. The road to Constantinople was now open. And to make matters worse, on the 26th of January, 447, during the second hour after midnight, an earthquake hit the city. The gleaming new walls built to protect it from the Huns were severely damaged. 57 towers collapsed. The next day, the Emperor Theodosius II walked barefoot, dressed in a simple white tunic, seven miles from the great palace located at the eastern end of the city to the walls. There he prayed that God would have mercy upon the Romans. A great crowd, including all the dignitaries of the Eastern Court and a multitude of citizens, joined him to chant the Trision, the invocation still in daily use in the Greek Orthodox Church, to appeal to God for mercy. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy upon us. Fortunately for the inhabitants of the city, the Praetorian prefect of the east, Flavius Constantinus, had no intention of waiting for God to come to their rescue. Instead, he was a man of action, 
typical of the ministers in the East and so unlike those in the West, who was determined to save the city before Attila reached it. In a show of extraordinary logistical organisation, he marshalled all the resources of the capital to rebuild the walls within just two months. Not only was every single skilled stonemason, artisan and labourer immediately summoned, but he also harnessed the energies of the two dominant factions in the city, the Blues and the Greens. These were two chariot racing associations whose fans were just just as fanatical as those of any modern football or baseball team. Normally they were locked in conflict, which could often turn violent, and after a brief attempt to make them work together, which failed spectacularly, he had the brilliant idea of making them compete. He gave them different sections of the walls to repair and set them competitions as to who could finish first. The result was that for 60 days, most of the city's inhabitants worked literally around the clock to rebuild the walls. Thousands of flaming torches burned throughout every night as the multitude of workers cut and laid stones. Today, we can still see one ancient commemoration of this astonishing achievement in modern Istanbul. Beside the modern bus station at the Mevlefahana Gate, as it's called in Turkish, is a marble slab cemented into the stonework of the ancient wall that reads in Latin, by Theodosius's command, Constantinus triumphantly built these strong walls in less than two months. Pallas Athene could hardly have built such a secure citadel in so short a time. Pallas Athene was the goddess of Athens and the guardian of the Acropolis. I can't help smiling that in their hour of need, the nominally Christian population of Constantinople remembered a pagan goddess as the example against which they measured their own efforts. Meanwhile, as the inhabitants of Constantinople worked by torchlight, Attila marched towards the city. He stopped to sack Marcianople, which was probably an unwise move, since when he came within striking distance of the city, it was too late. The walls had been repaired and were well manned. He didn't even bother to look, but swerved south to see if there was any way of crossing the Dardanelles into Asia. There he met another Roman army. Constantinus had mustered whatever legions he could from the Persian frontier, and in the Chersonesus close to modern Gallipoli, these confronted the Huns in a reportedly bloody battle. We have even less detail about this than about the Battle of the River Eutus, but again the Huns defeated the Romans. Although Attila abandoned any hope of crossing into Asia and swung back west through Thrace, and into Greece. He sacked cities along the way, but the most important ones survived, in particular Thessalonica and Adrianople, and if Athens was his aim, he never got there, for he was held up in the pass at Thermopylae, just as the Persian armies of Xerxes had been over 900 years before. Unable to take Constantinople or to cross the Dardanelles, and with his army probably weakened by heavy casualties in the two battles, Attila decided his best course of action was to force another humiliating treaty on the Romans and then go home. Theodosius sent the general Flavius Anatolius to negotiate with him. He agreed to an increase in the annual tribute from £1,400 of gold to £2,100, as well as the payment of £6,000 of arrears, since the Romans had stopped paying tribute four years previously in 443. In addition, the usual request for the return of refugees was made, as well as a new demand for the creation of a no-go zone south of the Danube in modern-day Bulgaria, up to 100 miles deep and 300 wide. Presumably, this was to secure the Danube frontier by pushing the Romans south, and though the East Romans probably didn't realise it, in my view, it may have showed that Attila was starting to lose interest in the East and casting his eyes to what might be easier prey in the West. More of that later. 
The Romans agreed to these terms. The main chronicler of these times, Priscus, noted wryly, quote, the Romans pretended that they made these arrangements voluntarily, but because of the overwhelming fear which gripped their commanders, they were compelled to accept gladly every injunction, however harsh, in their eagerness for peace, end quote. Priscus goes on to say that the tribute to the Huns crippled the finances of the Eastern Empire. Quote, Even senators contributed a fixed amount of gold. They paid only with difficulty, so that men who'd once been wealthy were putting up for sale their wives' jewellery and their furniture. This was the disaster that happened to the Romans after the war, and the result was that many killed themselves either by starvation or by hanging. The imperial treasuries were also emptied. End quote. However, my feeling is that Priscus was exaggerating the financial burden of the treaty. The tribute paid to Attila was certainly large, but let's not forget that Alaric had demanded similar sums when he was holding Rome to ransom. For example, in 408, at Stilicho's insistence, the Roman Senate had paid £4,000 of gold to buy Alaric off. In 409, they paid £5,000 of gold, 30000 of silver, 4,000 silk robes, 3,000 scarlet fleeces, and £3,000 of pepper. So, by comparison, the tribute paid to Attila was certainly not outrageous, and the financial burden was not as big as you might think. One historian has estimated that the total annual tax revenue of the Eastern Empire was around £66,000 of gold. This means that the annual tribute of £2,100 was only 3% of total revenue, and the combined hit with the £6,000 of arrears at the end of 447 would have been 12%. Significant, but not catastrophic. So the Eastern Empire was actually far from being broken financially by Attila. Another point worth emphasising is that the Eastern Romans hadn't lost any territory to the Huns, other than the small no-go zone below the Danube. The Huns hadn't even laid siege to Constantinople. Many major cities in Thrace and Greece had withstood them. The Eastern Roman army had also engaged Attila bravely and reportedly inflicted heavy casualties on the Huns. So, in my view, the East Romans weren't doing too badly against Attila, certainly far better than the Western Empire was doing against the Vandals, Goths and Franks. And I think it was for that reason Attila never returned to attack the Eastern Empire again. Instead, he now looked to the West. Before we get to his great Western offensive, which culminated in the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, one of the most decisive battles in history, let me briefly tell you a story that's as fascinating as it's important to our understanding of Attila. This is the account left to us by the Roman chronicler Priscus of his journey to see Attila in 449, after the Eastern Romans agreed to Attila's humiliating treaty. This is remarkable for two reasons. First, it's the only first-hand account we have describing Attila and life at the Hunnic court. And second, it's an exciting story of an assassination attempt on Attila in the style of a 5th century Mission Impossible. Indeed, I'm astonished that Tom Cruise hasn't made a film of it. So, the story goes like this. In 449, Attila sent two ambassadors to Constantinople to complain that the Romans hadn't kept to the Treaty of 447. Yes, the gold had been paid, but they hadn't returned enough of the Hunnic fugitives that was such an obsession for Attila, and the Romans had also been farming the land in the agreed no-go zone south of the Danube. Theodosius received the Hunnic ambassadors, heard their demands, and was more than happy to promise that he would rectify their complaints. But then one of his advisers, a eunuch called Chrysaphius, had a bright idea. 
Why not bribe one of these ambassadors to kill Attila? The ambassador they decided to approach was one of Attila's bodyguards called Adeco. Chris Affius held a secret meeting with him and offered him fifty pounds of gold if he would slay his master. Adeco agreed, and the Romans assembled an embassy to accompany him back to Attila, overtly to apologise and promise to abide by the terms of the treaty, but secretly to kill him. Now, we all know that the mission failed. Attila was not assassinated. But when I first read the story of this left to us by the Roman chronicler Priscus, I was gripped. It's a thrilling tale. A dashing young army officer, Maximinus, led the embassy as it worked its way across the land south of the Danube, devastated by the Huns, and into the wilds of the Hungarian plains where the Huns were camped. And to make the cast of characters interesting, he chose his best friend, Priscus, the future Roman chronicler, to accompany him. They were opposites. Maximinus was a man of action from a wealthy family, while Priscus was an intellectual who'd come from a poor family in the provinces to Constantinople to earn a living as a teacher of rhetoric. Despite their different backgrounds, they'd become best friends. And what makes the story especially gripping is that neither Maximinus nor Priscus had been told this was an assassination attempt. They were innocently walking straight into a trap. The only person who knew was their translator, Vigilus, who was fluent in Hunnic and Latin and Greek and had met Attila before. To cut a long story short, on reaching Attila's camp in the Hungarian plains, the Hunnic ambassador Adeco turned out to be no traitor and immediately told Attila the truth. The Romans had tried to bribe him and were not to be trusted. Attila could have had them all impaled on the spot, as he liked to do with spies, but he was also told that Maximinus and Priscus were innocent. In fact, they still knew nothing about not only the plot to kill Attila, but the fact that he now knew about it. They were, as they say, innocents abroad. So Attila decided to have a bit of fun with them. He not only spared them, but he was courteous to them and let them spend a couple of weeks trailing after him as he went about the business of ruling the Hunnic Empire. They were invited to dinners and official functions and were even once offered attractive women for the night, which they politely turned down. Although Priscus was not allowed to publish his account of his journey until years later, it became a Roman bestseller that has survived to this day. And what he said about Attila was truly fascinating, for he described a charismatic leader who commanded the complete loyalty of his subjects. In one famous passage, he described a dinner with Attila which showed him in a very different light from what you might expect, not the bloodthirsty tyrant of legend, but an intelligent and empathetic leader who didn't show off and treated his followers with respect. Quote, First, Attila's servant came in carrying a platter of meat. After him, everyone's waiters placed bread and cooked food on the tables. For the other barbarians and for us, lavish meals had been prepared placed on silver trays. But for Attila, there was nothing more than meat on a wooden platter. He showed himself moderate in everything else too. Gold and silver goblets were given to the feasters, but his own cup was wooden. His clothing too was frugal, since it cultivated no quality except cleanliness. Neither his sword hanging beside him, nor the fastenings of his barbarian shoes, nor his horse's bit, like those of the other Scythians, was adorned with gold or jewels or anything else that marks honour. End quote. Attila not only scorned bling, but he also showed respect for his followers. Quote, Once everyone was sitting in order, a cupbearer came in and gave Attila a wooden cup of wine. He took it and welcomed the man first in order. After Attila so honoured him, the man rose, and it was not right for him to sit, until he sipped from the wooden cup or drank it down and gave it back to the cupbearer. As he remained seated, everyone present honoured Honoured him in the same way, receiving their cups, offering a greeting and taking a sip. For each diner, 
Attila, there was one cupbearer who had to enter in a line when Attila's cupbearer departed. After the second man and the rest were honoured in turn, Attila greeted us in like manner according to the order of our seats. End quote. Attila employed a strict etiquette in his relations with his followers, but what's striking is that it was far more comradely than that of the Emperor Theodosius II, who required his followers to prostrate themselves on the ground before him, crawl to his feet and kiss the hem of his purple robe. Priscus's account was only published after the deaths of both Theodosius and Attila and became famous because it showed the barbarian Hun leader as far more civilised than the Roman emperors. Attila also had the last laugh over Theodosius. Although he allowed Priscus and Maximinus to return home unmolested, he held the Roman translator hostage until £100 of gold was paid, twice the amount that was intended for his would-be assassin. Next, he sent two more Hunnic ambassadors to Constantinople to rebuke the treacherous emperor. These Huns marched into the imperial chamber in front of hundreds of Roman dignitaries, and instead of falling to their feet in front of him and crawling to kiss the hem of his purple robe, they walked up to him and threw at his feet the bag which had contained the gold for the would-be assassin. Then one of them told Theodosius that this was no way for a slave to treat his master. Theodosius's humiliation must have been quite a spectacle to behold, and I'm sure many of the Romans present were struggling not to laugh. But by this time, Attila had lost interest in the Eastern Roman Empire. His gaze was moving west. The battle for the Eastern Empire was over. The battle for the West was about to begin. And that ends this episode. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, of course, I'd be delighted for any ratings or reviews in whichever podcast app you use. And if you want to hear more about the Romans, please sign up to my newsletter at nickholmesauthor.com. And I'm pleased to say that I'm hoping to go back to weekly podcasts now, and in the next episode, we'll find out what happened when Attila invaded the West. Thanks for listening, and see you next time. <laughs>